Welcome to this podcast on an integrated scenario. This will involve a discussion about a particular scenario which will be discussed in the podcast and all the questions will be related to the hardware, software, internet and networking, data and information and solution development related and applied to this integrated scenario. These topics are from question 9 of the 2024 Computer Applications Technology November Paper 2 exam or theory exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video first. The link to the PDF is in the video description. Then go and attempt those questions. And finally, come back and listen to the podcast so that you can compare the discussion with your answers. If you want to use the podcast to learn new information, then first listen to the discussion, then download the questions, the PDF link in the video description mentioned earlier, and then test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about how the different forms of computing can be applied to this integrated scenario. And now let's hear what our podcasters have to say about this particular scenario. Welcome back to the deep dive. You know, sometimes the most complex computing problems, they're kind of hidden inside these seemingly simple real world scenarios. And today we're tackling exactly one of those. Uh, it's tailored specifically for you, the learner who's tracking the applied side of computer studies. So the situation is this, uh, a high school is celebrating its 50th birthday big milestone. And the organizing committee, their big project is to create a commemorative e-magazine. Now, this project, it sounds straightforward, but it actually forces the committee to navigate some really complex technical decisions, things that span, well, pretty much every facet of integrated computing. We're talking network policies, payment systems, the whole lot. It's a, a perfect case study, really. Okay, let's unpack this. Right. And our mission today is to analyze the strategic choices the committee had to make, you know, at every single stage. We're not just listing concepts here. We want to explain the why behind their technical decisions. This deep dive, it really connects the dots across, well, probably your entire syllabus. It shows how everything, connectivity, data management, security, it all has to work together for a project like this to actually succeed. Okay, so let's start right at the beginning. The fundamental decision. Why go digital? I mean, for a 50th anniversary, tradition kind of screams print thousands of copies, right? So why did the committee strategically choose an e-magazine? Well, it seems they prioritized modernity and uh, impact. Print definitely have that nostalgic feel, sure, but digital just has superior functionality these days. The key advantage, according to the source material we looked at, is the ability to include interactive elements. Think about it. A printed page just has static quotes, but an e-magazine, you can embed a video message from, say, the school founder, or maybe a clickable link to a huge photo gallery. That just dramatically changes the whole storytelling capability. Yeah, totally. And the financial side of that choice must be massive, too. They'd see significant cost savings, wouldn't they? Because they basically eliminate the entire production cost of printing, binding, distributing physical books. Precisely. And here's something vital for a collaborative project like this. The ease of change and updating content. Imagine they finish the layout, everything's perfect, and then like a week before launch, an important alumni sends in this amazing memory. Making that update in an e-magazine, pretty trivial, relatively speaking. If it were already printed, well, that update would be impossible or maybe ruinously expensive. That makes sense. And the reach too, it's just incomparable. You share a PDF or an online link and suddenly alumni all over the world can see it instantly. That vastly expands the audience. Oh, and we should probably also highlight the environmental benefits, you know, saving paper and also the built-in accessibility features that digital publishing offers, things like compatibility with screen readers, making sure everyone can actually enjoy the history. Yeah, good points. So once they committed to digital, the next big hurdle wasn't really about content, surprisingly. It was about connection. The committee members, they all need to collaborate smoothly, right, which means relying heavily on the school's wireless network. And any shared workspace like that, it needs ground rules. If mm. you've got students, teachers, committee members all sharing the network, possibly working on sensitive files, what's the immediate like non-negotiable policy that has to be in place? They absolutely must have an established AUP. That's an acceptable use policy. And this policy, it isn't just about security, although that's part of it. It's also crucially about resource management. It clearly defines what's appropriate behavior, what kind of files could be shared, just ensuring the network resources aren't misused or, you know, overlaid by totally irrelevant traffic. Got it. 
And for any individual committee member to even get onto that network, to access those shared files, or even just read the AUP itself, what piece of hardware is essential inside their computer? That would be the network adapter. You can sort of think of it as the device's translator and um, its entry point to the network. It's the component that enables the physical or more likely the wireless connection. It takes the device's internal data, converts it into a signal the network understands, and does the reverse for incoming signals. Pretty crucial. Right. Now let's talk about that classic frustration during collaboration. They're trying to share and edit these huge image files for the e-magazine, and suddenly, bam, the network just slows to a crawl for everyone. What's the strategic computing knowledge we can apply here to troubleshoot that lag? Well, the sources generally point to three main categories of problems here. First off, capacity. If everyone is uploading massive files at the exact same time, you just get too much network traffic or congestion. It essentially means there isn't enough bandwidth available to handle everything smoothly. Second, it could be the file sizes themselves. I mean, high resolution images, maybe video interview clips. They are simply too large for a busy network to handle efficiently sometimes. Okay, capacity and file size. And the, the third category, that's more the physical stuff, isn't it? Like equipment failure. Exactly. It could simply be a weak signal if they happen to be sitting too far from the wireless access point. Mm. Or it could just be faulty or outdated hardware. You know, if the school's router hasn't been upgraded in years, it just might not be able to handle the demands of modern high data workflows. Okay. Okay. Here's where it gets really interesting. So they need to gather content. This involves interviewing alumni, maybe retired staff who might live hours away or even overseas. The decision was made use video conferencing for efficiency. Smart move, probably. It definitely solves a logistical nightmare, yeah. <laughs> but it immediately introduces technical constraints. The main disadvantage that jumps out is that it demands a constant, really fast internet connection. If that connection fluctuates, the interview quality just collapses. You get freezes, dropouts. It's not good. Plus, if the committee member is using, say, a mobile connection, video absolutely chews through data very quickly. It could deplete their data cap super fast. Hmm. Yeah, the data cap issue is real. And we also have to acknowledge the uh, the interpersonal trade-off, right? Mm. While it's convenient, you inevitably lose some of the depth you get from physical face-to-face -face contact. It limits the full spectrum of nonverbal cues you can pick up on. That's a really critical point. So to try and mitigate those drawbacks, the committee needs meticulous preparation. Good practices for these online interviews, they start with the basics. Eliminating background noises, you know, barking dogs, traffic and making sure all the equipment, camera, microphone is set up correctly before the call starts. Mm. Crucially, they absolutely must ensure the entire interview is recorded for later use for transcription. Mm -hmm. And you know, simple things like having good lighting so the speaker's visible and making sure they're audible, speaking clearly. Okay, wait a second. We just talked about the disadvantages, how video conferencing limits nonverbal cues. If that's true, why is conducting an interview, even a video one, still considered like the superior information gathering method compared to just emailing out a written questionnaire? Ah, that's the strategic distinction you see. The real value of an interview, even a video one, is that it allows for deeper insight, clarification, and follow-up questions in real time. A questionnaire is static. You only get answers to the specific questions you ask, nothing more. In an interview, even with slightly limited visual cues, you can pivot the discussion based on someone's tone or an unexpected detail they mention. The response is immediate. And the process itself, it inherently helps in building relationships with these key contributors, which is pretty essential for a celebratory magazine like this. It makes sense. Okay, moving on to the history part. 50 years. That means digging through decades of archives, old photos, typed memos, all that stuff. They have to digitize this material using a scanner. First, let's just quickly define the resolution standard. What does MP stand for when we talk about camera or scanner resolution? All right, MP stands for megapixel. It's basically the unit of resolution, literally means a million pixels, and it determines the amount of detail captured by the device, whether it's a camera or a scanner. A high megapixel count is pretty crucial if you're scanning old photos that might need to be enlarged for the magazine layout. Gotcha. Megapixel. Okay. And say they find an old typed school assembly program from like 1975. They want to quote from it, but they definitely don't want to manually retype the entire thing. What's the specialized software that turns a picture of text into text you can actually copy, paste, and edit? Ah, that's OCR software. Stands for Optical Character Recognition. And it's a truly transformative tool in situations like this. When you scan a document normally, you usually just get a static 
image file, basically, a picture of words. OCR works differently. It analyzes that image, interprets the patterns of pixels as specific letters and numbers, and then produces an actual editable soft copy from that scanned document. It saves just countless hours of tedious data entry. Okay, OCR. Very useful. But there's a big warning mentioned in the source material regarding the really antique items, those genuine 50-year-old photos. Why should the committee maybe be extremely hesitant about scanning the most fragile originals? Yeah, the risks here are both physical and digital, unfortunately. Digitally, the photos themselves have often degraded over time, meaning the scan will likely result in poor quality images, sadly. Worse, perhaps, the scanner will faithfully capture all the imperfections. Every single tear, crack, crease, and stain will be perfectly digitized. But the biggest concern is probably conservation. These fragile photos might easily be damaged during the handling, the physical process of placing them on the scanning bed. It's also incredibly time-consuming to scan high-quality versions one by one, especially if you have hundreds. Right, risk of damage and poor quality. Okay, so once they have all this massive content, the interview recordings, the edited documents from OCR, the hopefully decent digital images, the file sizes are going to be huge. The committee needs a central, robust place to store everything. Which brings us to storage strategy. Cloud storage versus just relying on committee members' local hard drives. Yeah, for collaboration and definitely for disaster recovery, cloud storage is pretty much the non-negotiable choice here. The sources really highlight the incredible convenience factor. You get access from any device, anywhere, anytime, basically, as long as you have an internet connection. And in a project with so many moving parts, people contributing, that backup space aspect is crucial, isn't it? If a committee member's laptop suddenly dies mid-edit, the work isn't lost forever. Exactly. That redundancy, that safety net, it's priceless. Furthermore, we have to think about security. A professional cloud service provider generally offers far more robust security measures, encryption, things like that, than relying solely on individual committee members' local storage systems. Plus, it saves local storage space on everyone's devices, which can be a bonus. And it often provides built-in synchronization services, ensuring everyone's working with the latest versions of files. Okay, lots of advantages to cloud. Let's shift gears now to the actual creation phase, the design of the e-magazine. The committee needs the right tools, the right software to bring this vision to life. Absolutely. And the committee has quite diverse options when it comes to application software. The sources mentioned potentially using specialized desktop publisher software to give very precise layout control. Or they could use general designing software for maybe quick mock-ups or basic pages. They might even repurpose presentation software like PowerPoint or Keynote. Essential content work, like writing articles, will almost certainly use word processing software. And if they plan to host the e-magazine directly on a web page, then web design software would be necessary too. Let's zoom in on a specific layout detail, something you often need when using, say, a word processor to compile text sections. To make the e-magazine look really professional, they need an image placed perfectly next to a paragraph so the text flows neatly around it, no big awkward gaps. What specific feature controls that text image interaction? Oh, uh, that feature is called text wrapping. It essentially controls how the text moves or wraps around an inserted image or object. It ensures a neat, professional-looking layout instead of just forcing the text into a simple block above or below the graphic. Very important for visual appeal. Text wrapping. Got it. And maybe as a final step in the digital build, they decide, OK, we need to put an order form on the school's main website so people can actually buy the completed e-magazine. They need a clickable link from the website to that form which essential HTML tag and attribute are required to create that hyperlink. All right. To create any kind of navigational link on a web page, you absolutely need the, a tag, which stands for anchor, paired with the href attribute. The A tag tells the browser, hey, this is a hyperlink, and the href attribute hypertext reference specifies the exact destination, the URL, of where that link should go, in this case, the order form page. Okay, a tag href attribute. Simple but essential. So we've built the e-magazine. Now comes the final piece. Monetization. Selling it. Let's say they sell it to learners in the school corridor at a physical point of sale or POS terminal. They plan to use NFC payments. How does the secure transaction actually work? Like when they tap their card or phone. Okay, so NFC stands for near field communication. It's basically a method of very short range, high frequency wireless communication. The payment process is initiated by bringing the POS terminal and the learner's device could be a smartphone, a watch, or just their bank card into close contact, literally just tapping or hovering very close. This allows for the wireless transfer of data between the two. Crucially, the security aspect works because the data transferred usually isn't the raw credit card number. Instead, it's often a tokenized encrypted signal. It represents the payment details, but doesn't expose them directly. 
making the transaction both incredibly fast and secure. Clever. Tokenization. Okay, and what about the parents, or maybe alumni, who want to purchase the e-magazine from the comfort of their own home? The committee needs to facilitate various online payment methods to make it easy for everyone, right, to maximize sales. What kind of digital methods should they realistically support? Yeah, they really need to offer a comprehensive list to cater to diverse user preferences and technical comfort levels. This definitely includes traditional methods like online banking via EFT, electronic funds transfer, and standard electronic card payments, Visa, MasterCard, etc. Then you've got more modern consumers who might rely on specialized money sending services, things like cash send or e-wallet services offered by banks. They should also probably integrate with secure payment gateways like PayPal, which are often linked directly through banking apps these days. Oh, and the sources even mention the possibility, maybe a bit niche for a school, but the possibility of accepting payment via cryptocurrency, which just reflects the, uh, the current diverse state of digital finance, I suppose. Wow. Okay. Quite a list. So after all that, uh, what does this all mean? What's the big picture here? Well, I think it means the committee's success wasn't just about creativity or historical content. It was fundamentally about seamless technical integration. Every single choice they made from deciding e-magazine, not print, right at the start, to using OCR on old documents, to enabling NFC payments, every one was a strategic computing decision. The entire project required constant, careful management of data size, collaborative workflows, ensuring good connectivity, and maintaining security throughout. It's really amazing when you break it down like that, how much complex infrastructure and planning goes into what seems like a simple celebratory item. Absolutely. And if you look closely, the core requirement weaving through all these different processes, whether it's the need for fast video conferencing or securely tapping a card for an NFC payment, there's a shared vital necessity underneath it all. Yeah. Absolute trust and high speed secure data transfer. You know, we began this conversation discussing internal network policies, specifically the AUP, needed to manage resource traffic within the school network. And we finished up by talking about external security measures like tokenization and NFC payments. So here's a thought to leave you with. Consider how these fundamental network policies, both internal like the AUP and the external security measures built into payment systems or cloud storage, how they are constantly working together, balancing efficiency and safety in data transfer. This happens across every single application and transaction you use daily. That intricate balance, that's really the invisible infrastructure that makes our modern digital life possible. Just a reminder to find other podcasts, go to the video description, you'll find links to them as well. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support the channel, subscribe to Atmos Long Computer Terms and share us with your friends so that we can help other people not do it the long way, but do it the Mr. Long Way.